right, thank you for staying with Daybreak. The State of the Nation conversation still continues. We talk about matters, politics, and everything in between there. We're still talking about matters, housing now. Then we'll talk about health crisis in just a bit. We'd like to hear your feedback at Trevor Mbidi at Citizen TV Kenya. Use the hashtag Daybreak. Honorable Dan Manzo is still here. Senator from Aquini. Honorable Professor Tomo Gianda. Senator from Kisumu is with us. Honorable Jane Kagiri, woman rep for like Kipia and Irungu Houghton, Executive Director, Amnesty International Kenya, is still with us here. Kagiri, I was coming to you on this issue of the housing. And the issue here is not there seems to be consensus even on this table that it is necessary. It's necessary. It is the how that is the problem right there. Yes. Do you agree with how it's being done? Uh, Trevor, let me first start by stating, I said I speak the layman's language. But to Senator Manzo, it didn't mean that I don't know English. I don't <laughs> read and write. Mm -hmm. Because I remember on the day before we started the public participation, it's good I mentioned that I'm in the housing committee in parliament. Mm -hmm. The day before we started public participation, a court in Kisumu ruled that it had not stopped the public participation. And from then on, we started doing the public participation. And I must state we visited 11 counties as the housing committee. And then the finance committee visited another, I think, 13 counties. And to Senator Manzo, let me tell you, we started with Kirinyaga, Embu. We went to Kiambu. We went to Nairobi. Then we entered Machakos. And from Machakos, we went to Turkana, led by an Azimio governor. He participated in the public participation. There on, we went to Wajia, led by an ODM governor. He participated in the public participation. Then we went on to Malindi, Kilifi, Mombasa, and there's one more county, Tana River, all led by Azimio governors. Trevor, let me tell you, here on TV, we can come and say all things that we want for the sake of national politics. But when we go back to the ground, Everybody knows their person's needs. And I believe that's why these governors attended these public participations for them to show the need that they have for housing in their counties and for them to even show support towards the initiative. Because it was also in the Azimio Manifesto. Then Trevor, let me give you four instances very quickly of why I believe these houses are necessary. And I'll give the first instance of a lady who spoke in Nairobi during the public participation. And uh, she spoke after FKE had spoken. And FKE of course speaks for the employers. And I believe I'm an employee, so FK was also stating my grievances. But this lady stood and said, uh, I agree with all that you said, FKE. You people feel offended that you're being deducted this levy and all that. And that's to you, Trevor, and everybody seated here. Then the lady goes on and says, you're forgetting. It is my daughter who takes care of your children. Like, now I'm seated here. My house help will ensure my child is ready for school on time. Uh, she said her son is the one who drives us to work. Her husband is the one who repairs our cars when they're broken down. And she said, her herself is the one who cooks in those schools where our children go. So she asked a simple question and said, we support you to become successful. That's where Trevor, you have a mortgage, I have a mortgage because of these people. Because in this instance, if my household says she was leaving, I would leave this show and run home. But she has given me such a comfortable environment for me to be able to thrive. But what we forget at the end of the day, this lady asked, do you want us to remain poor? and to remain your subjects that we don't have a right to own a house, you should not be deducted for you to support us. That is a question any person opposing affordable housing should answer to themselves. Number two, Trevor, we went on to Tana River. An old man stood up and said, my only question is one, I am here to see who is opposing the affordable housing. He looked around, no hand was lifted, and he sat down. Let me tell you, Trevor, in the 11 counties that we visited, not one person stood and said they don't affordable housing. So just as we are saying, the whole country agrees that affordable housing is a major need. Uh, the next example I'll give you, Trevor, is Machakos, where we visited and a lady who sells, I think, tomatoes somewhere, told us she lives in a place called Carton City. Maybe Senator Manzo might know it. And they explained that Carton City means papers put together to build your house. And she said for the first time she has hope that finally she can live in a concrete house. This lady spoke and said the worst mistake we've done about affordable housing is to put a deposit, because that's the only hindrance between her and the affordable housing. Today, the deposit is no longer there for people of that category. So I'd want to say, as we sit here, please can we just speak from personal experiences and from the people around us? I have a mortgage. Does any of my staff have mortgage? The answer is no. In this country, less than 2 million people can access mortgage, yet we have a population of 52 million. So what are we saying to the others? They should remain poor? They should remain helpless. Yeah. They should remain in shanties, in dirty houses, in places without sewages. I believe the answer is no, and yeah. that is why we are supposed to, uh, to support them. Last three, Trevor, uh, my house is very democratic. I remember as we were campaigning, one day I walked in, and my house helped, whom I could tell was Azimio, by how she always smiled when uh, Honorable Raila was on TV. <laughs> <laughs> one day I walked into the house, and she tells me, uh, Mami, imagine, Ruto said, uh, we are going to get houses at 5,000 shillings per month. Today, 
that is being executed. Would I go back to my house up and tell her, I don't want to support that dream of yours that you have? That's the question I want to ask each and every person okay. who is opposing the dream of But Kagiri, in all these public participations, yes. if we were also there and walking around with you guys, there's one thing that keep, kept coming up. Yeah. Let this contribution be voluntary. Trevor, how come that was not implemented? You say that public participation was done properly. Yes. But how come that was ignored? Trevor, we have been explained to a lot about the dreams and aspirations we have as a country. And for me, the answer I would give to that is, we all speak about how successful His Excellency, the late President Kibaki was. He is the one who came up with Vision 2030. We are a country that always condemns the government for putting up good documents and shelving them somewhere. Here comes a president who is ready to implement what we have always been dreaming about. And I believe one of the anchors of uh, Vision 2030 was creating wealth for the poor. This is one such opportunity for these people. So when we talk about how we are going to achieve all these big dreams that we talk about, in fact, another aspect of affordable housing is the institutional housing. We look at TV every day, everybody, people speaking about our policemen live in bad housing and all that. It is part of this program. We all want to complain. We all want to have a good country. But how are we going to raise resources towards it? Today, in fact, one of the issues that was raised in the public participations, somebody said, why don't you do what His Excellency Uhuru was doing? Or what do you, why don't you do what was being done uh, before? Ask yourself, why are we in the problems we are in today? Because of excessive borrowing. So do we want to go back to excessive borrowing at the expense of us wanting good housing and better livelihoods? Or do we want to accept to bear the brunt, be hit hard, and ensure we get a better country okay. at the end of the day? Irungu, was it, were, the, were the people's views taken into account? I know you interact with them quite a lot. Yeah, I mean, I just, you know, I think there are a number of things. I think we have to be very careful not to position this argument as one class against the other, right? So if we position it that middle class people are whining, that they are um, hardened, um, uh, resources are being frittered away for the working class and the working class deserve a bit of the middle class salary, I think what we're doing is creating a class you know, kind of a false class tension that is, is not there. If you look at the studies, there were at least six studies last year that I can quote, and I was just looking at them again, <clears throat> that were done, surveys that were done. And it is true that, first of all, you know, kind of 89% of the, of the country uh, think house ownership is critical. It's vital, right? So I think that one we can probably all agree with on the table. Um, how many people thought they would get homes as a result of the um, program? Um, less than, I think it was less than 60%, 54% of the people who were surveyed by um, a number of different surveys felt that they would never get access to these uh, homes. Um, we know that um, in, in uh, the TIFA study, I think it was uh, just before Christmas, 69% of the population were against this levy. So um, I'm sure that study was done not among middle class people sitting in Keleleshu and Muthaiga and, uh, um, and Karen. It was done nationally and was sampled effectively. So I think there is a challenge of this program coming from the public, not because people don't believe that, they, that everybody should have the right to a house, a house. It's that there's not much faith in the way that it's done. And I think the, most irk, uh, the issue that is irking most people or is giving people most stress is this point that has been raised, voluntary versus mandatory, yeah. right? Um, yes, we may all on this table being, I guess, over 100,000 shillings per month be middle class. But I think the reality is that uh, everybody on this table has a mortgage already. You know? So the, the problem is, is, are we now uh, paying for other people uh, to get a mortgage? So I think, you know, just from the, from the uh, public surveys that have been done, I think we have to be a bit more, I guess, circumspect about how popular is this project. Um, but I do agree that at, the, at certain levels during the public participation, there were, um, I guess, voices that were supportive of the project. I think the other thing to note, and it's in the papers today, I think page, what is it, page 19 um, of the standard has an interesting study that um, Tala has just done. They released it yesterday. And they said something like, the number of consumers with alternative sources of income has declined to 58% um, in the last um, uh, year, which uh, despite, and maybe uh, Dan would love this one, is um, there is 75% of the people that they serviced are, are optimistic that the world will change, that um, there's, there's a future. And maybe, actually, maybe it's Jane who will be much more interested oh, yeah. in this one. <laughs> but Dan will be comforted also, <laughs> and, and maybe myself as well. But, you know, 75% of the population are optimistic that the circumstances will change. That is a good sign, because I think without optimism, you only have 
pessimism and then the possibility of really destructive uh, negative um, uh, behavior. But I think the other thing is that you know 58% um, of the people that they um, uh, surveyed have actually seen their businesses close over the last two to three months, right? So this is probably um, the reality that most people are facing. And many of them, I guess, top, uh, public, pop, popular now, we would say they are um, hustlers, right? These are the, the, uh, the, the class that actually produces the leadership um, that sits in the National Assembly. So one of the concerns there is, are you asking them to take on more onerous taxes at a time that their businesses are closing? Um, and that's not a middle class, Muthaiga, uh, Karen, I don't know what's the equivalent in uh, Kisumu. <laughs> Mili 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 Mili. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Prof, let me bring in on this. Do, yeah. do you see a gap in legislation? Because essentially, one, housing is a devolved function. And second, mm. this land that the affordable housing is going to be built on is essentially public land, but then will now be owned privately. How do you then ensure that that staggers to the rest of the society? Because there are some people who say that in itself is exclusive because it's public land. Then you, if I buy a house there, now it's owned privately. What does that mean for the next Kenyan who did not get a house there? Um, well, Trevor, um, the land, the framework for the management of land is found in, in Chapter 5 of the Constitution. And Article 63 talks about community land and the fact that the National Land Commission is involved in the process of transferring land uh, that is held by the community, or in, the, in this case, the county, and on which all these old estates uh, stand. Now, it is not lost to any of us that the affordable housing pros uh, program has just commenced, the national government or private contractors are uh, contracting, but of course, the national government engages the county government in all these projects. Eventually, with the transfer process, because that, the lease process will come at the tail end, the National Land Commission would obviously be engaged or involved. It's a very simple solution. The NLC will be involved in the final transaction that transfers or that leads to the issuance of title to individuals. Remember, and I'll give you a, a perfect example, in Kisumu, for instance, we have two estates, old estates. We have Lumumba estate, where there are residents. Uh, the, I think it's, 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 imagine in Lumumba estate, for instance, two bedroom houses constructed by the old municipality were renting or had rents of 4,000 shillings per unit for two bedrooms. Now that shows you how dilapidated and how hopeless the housing scheme was in our counties. Of course, now we, the framework, the new, under the new framework, Lumumba said is it will be demolished to keep pave way for affordable housing. The unique legal framework will simply to transcend or to have the NLC involved in transferring that unit of land to the national government for purposes of affecting this process and for purposes of eventually of owners having leases, processing leases. It's a simple transaction. Right. That should never be a bar to any of these things. Mm -hmm. So NLC will give its authority at the right time because now what is happening, Trevor, is that contracts are being signed, processes are going on, but this is a legal question that would be resolved to lead to uh, titles to the individual owners. Okay. We are not yet at the stage of <laughs> transferring uh, the units to purchase us. The board has just come into place. Applications will be made. Houses are being constructed. We are at the stage of giving contracts as well. So I think there's no issue there. That is actually, in my view, yes. an issue. Okay. Trevor, that's just, disagrees. Yes, that's just theoretical. You know, yes. that's theory. First of all, I'm a, I'm a land expert. everybody, I'm a land yeah, expert. Yeah. first of all, everyone um, wants there to be affordable housing. Yeah. We want everybody to live in a decent house. Uh, the question is the how. First and foremost, it is true there is government. You know, there, is, there used to be government. There is government lands act, uh, and uh, first of all, housing is devolved, and then you have community land and you have public land. Now, the public land available is in the counties, 
And the counties have not been engaged sufficiently on this. We are happy with what is already, uh, you know, houses going, is going on and has been going. You know, houses have been constructed all through by the National Housing Co Corporation. Uh, and the people have access houses. We've, we've got even the, uh, the slum upgrading you know, program. Uh, and uh, when you compare what's happening in Kenya with what is in Rwanda, in Rwanda, the people remove from the houses so that they construct better houses. They are the same people who return to that house and they have enough trust to the government. When the government says you'll come back to your place, you surely come back. But that's not what's been happening in Kenya. You are removed, you know, from a slum. And then when the houses are constructed, you are nowhere near there. You are sent back to your village or you to another slum in Nairobi. <laughs> and this is where we are saying these are the missing gaps. So when it comes to, I want to give a good example now. In Makweni, let's go county by county. First of all, how are you going to share this equitably? She said they went to 11 counties. There are 47 counties in this country. And, we were, and every county is unique. And we were saying in the Senate, which we were, we were overruled, that let public participation take place again at Senate level and let it go to the 47 counties. That never happened. We are going to deal with that in court because that is already discrimination, is lack of equity, and it can't work. Now, we, we, if I narrow down to Makweni, we have, uh, we have a public land where they were doing houses for, 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 for government workers, which has taken 30 years to complete. And the president came and uh, promised that very quickly it will be done. He has a contractor already. Then, you know, uh, we need, there's something called local, local. How do the local people in every county benefit? Now, you, you have a, a contractor from Nairobi who is brought to Makweni. And he treats the workers and the, you know, as, as he feels, because there's no standard structure as to uh, what's going to be the payment of the masons and the plumbers and all that. And then, uh, the, the, once they finish this particular house, house on a particular land we know, now the president promised another seven, 700 houses of which, first of all, we are demanding, it must be done by the local, local contractors. We have contractors in Makweni. And then, now this 700 promised is going to be done on what land? Is it private land? Is it public land which belongs to the county and doesn't exist in Makweni already? Or is the government going to buy land so that now it can do affordable houses and then look for people who are previously landless? How do you even identify these people so that you make sure that it, is, it is equitable? The truth of the matter is there is too much theory in this. There are too many lies in this. And the reality is that this law was pushed through parliament. It's a dictatorship. Parliament was only a rubber stamp. There was no considering of that particular bill. Uh, and it's a high time the government stopped making fake promises and false promises. President Kibaki is the best example in this country. Never talked much, but acted a lot. He did the thicker road. He never went around, say, all in rallies there, say, we're going to do the thick highway. No. People woke up and found people working. So we want the houses to be there. We want a structure of making sure that there is equity and fairness. Or now, that particular poor person who was talking in a public participation yeah. has a chance of getting a house. You are lying to the people that a house which you build with six million, you will sell it at, uh, you know, at 400,000. It's not possible. So that we, we, we want to be fair and truthful to Kenyans. Okay. Let me bring some feedback real quick, then take final remarks on this housing issue. Then we talk about the health and crisis now. Let's see what you're saying about this housing and the conversation we're having, and then we move to health in crisis. I'll give you each a chance to just for closing remarks on this housing issue. Emusao says, I agree with Manzo. Being voted doesn't make you the most brilliant person. <laughs> you can't go to parliament and vote for bills that your constituents clearly have said no under the disguise of doing what is good for them. We sent you to vote for us, not what you think is good. Okay. The Duncan254 uh, says, tell me a reason why a Kenyan MP or a CS should earn more than a Kenyan doctor without medical covers, and I will tell you none. Now, this is about the health crisis that we're talking about in just a short while. Okele Mwalimu says, remind Professor Tomo Gender that we are already overtaxed. His argument that we don't want to pay taxes at all is not only laughable, but also misleading. As a lawyer, he should concentrate on improving the legal infrastructure of his newfound friends in the executive. <laughs> okay. The Duncan again says the senator works as lyrical in big English, yet parliament cushioned themselves from the same law they passed. Hypocrites. Okay. 
Okango says the Affordable Housing Act 2024 provides that a person is eligible for allocation of one affordable housing unit if the person meets the criteria prescribed in regulations. Can Ojienda and Laikipia Women Representative explain where are the regulations? Okay, I'll give you a chance to respond to that. Where are the regulations? Daniel Sindani says the state of the nation is when life becomes more difficult with more taxes and levies being imposed and the economy shrinking, legislators like one of the senators on that show is seeing hope in the midst of despair because of eating. <laughs> Frank Orinde says public participation in this country is done as a formality. Our views never count in the final reports. Parliamentary committees present what pleases their bosses and their own personal views. Skewed reports by excellence. Okay. Moses Mayer says the answer should be in our income capability. How many Kenyans can sustain a monthly rate of 5,000 until they actually own the house? What happens if I can no longer pay? Okay. Peter says, through the housing levy, many youths will get employment. The Azimio Manifesto had affordable housing as one of the key pillars. Let members from opposition stop this hypocrisy and embrace the project. Okay. Gadua says, the state of the nation is that, if, uh, that of, uh, of the people in an understaffed country where health practitioners spend years in training only to be sent to work abroad by a government that cannot make overpriced passports available, we can only live by hope. Okay. Nikoma Ingi says, from a preliminary situation analysis of the, count, uh, of the country, I still believe housing isn't a priority. What will happen to the contributors who will, will not benefit from the said houses? Okay. Master Bakari, lastly here, says there must be super scrutiny on this housing levy to ensure that graft and its elements are not perpetrated. Now, the processes should be above all manner of reproach to gain the confidence of all the Kenyans. I'll give you each a chance for closing on this issue of housing, then we get into the health crisis. Now, in general, I'll start with you, and there was a question there in terms of regulation. There's still a lot that the people still don't understand about. <coughs> somebody asking, so what happens if I contribute and I don't get the house? Yeah. Thank you, Trevor. Again, the regulations are leave to senior counsel to take us through, though I know we attended public participation, listened to the people, and I would want to say these are what will be considered in the regulations uh, based on the Affordable Housing Act. Uh, let me tell you, Trevor, all you said that was picked at the public participation was about the levy and the discontent of Kenyans contributing towards it. However, there was a lot that we picked and has been considered. The first one, the Mamambogas, the border borders, the people living in those areas asked us one question. Uh, we have these people who own the hardwares, and it's likely that the people with the money. After the houses are completed, this man will come and buy 10 houses, and he's not been contributing to the levy. Mm -hmm. If you look at it now, everybody has been considered to contribute towards this levy. Number two, they asked the question on ownership where they said that uh, most times they are moved away from a place where Senator Manzo spoke about, and after construction, the priority is given to other people. We have made it very clear. And even right now, enumeration is taking place before uh, people are moved from a place, so that the first priority will go to the people who first occupied that property. And it's good to tell Kenyans, Trevor, we have an example of Park Road down here. Park Road occupies seven acres. And before affordable housing, it had 39 uh, units on it. Today, after affordable housing construction, Park Road has 1,370 houses on it. So again, as much as we want to demonize this affordable housing, are we also comfortable with so many people living in the slums, yet we have spaces where people could occupy? That is another question. The other thing is uh, we had questions from Amambogas and border, border, border Riders asking us, I want to own a house. How do I contribute towards that? It is prudent for me to answer that if you click star 832 hash, and register on Bomayangu, you can start your journey to owning a house. By paying 200 shillings, 100 shillings, save up until you get there. So Trevor, so much was listened to during public participation, and we have actually factored it in. And it is good to note that public participation in this modern day and age, Trevor, you have said you traverse the counties with us. There is no way you could stop anybody from saying what they wanted to say. These days, everybody is a social media, everybody is a journalist by themselves, so they can pass information in whichever way they would want to pass that information. Finally, it's good to answer to Senator Manzo, where he said that we only uh, traversed 11 counties. No, the answer is we traversed more than 50% of the counties in this country, because we were two committees, that was Finance Committee and the Housing Committee. So we went separately, but totally we covered more than 50 counties, 50% 50 of the counties. Okay. Irungu? 
finally on this housing issue? So I think, I think just my final comments is, you know, that um, we must never be comfortable in a situation where 60% of Nairobi, for example, live in substandard housing. So I think I agree with Jane that the discomfort must be there. Um, on uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Governor Sakaja was in the National Assembly and he was, I think it was National Assembly, not Senator. Um, and he was um, making the point that from a national, from a Nairobi County government perspective, they are planning to uh, build 40,000 units across 13 um, uh, areas, and I think it was about 4,000 acres that they were looking at targeting. And um, one of the problems that they were facing, and I think this is one that needs to be addressed by all of us, not just people in government, but also the civic sector, is that many of these uh, properties do not have title deeds. Now, I know this from previous work when I used to work on protecting schools against land grabbing. And uh, one of the things that we were able to do with the National Lands Commission, and when I say we, the Shuleyangu campaign was able to do with the National Lands Commission and also the Ministry of uh, Lands, was to accelerate titles for public properties. Um, Nancy Gadungu at the Auditor General's office, um, I think yesterday, and maybe even in the papers today, uh, noted that the, one of the biggest problems we've got is that, um, she, I think the figure was 259 uh, properties that they've identified that are large in scope. Uh, public properties just don't have title deeds. And securing, uh, you know, I think the um, legal framework for much of our public uh, properties is still not at the place where we need to be. And I think the issue for me is if this is going to be a success project, let us also work on land governance and the integrity of, um, of title deeds. Okay, Prof? And, and maybe I, I pick up where, from where Irung mm. has, has left, that uh, the end National Land Commission, of course, would work within the framework and fill the gap between the national government and counties in terms of ownership so that uh, you are able to sanitize or ensure that when leases are finally uh, given to individual purchasers, uh, then at least th there will be no, uh, no litigation around this question. But le let me say this, uh, Trevor, that low-level uh, cadre civil servants, uh, cleric officers, uh, policemen of lower grade, uh, corporals, secretaries who work in institutions, um, uh, basically mid-level people, including tea boys and tea girls who have a pay slip, for the first time have an opportunity to own a house and contribute because of this scheme. I think the biggest uh, concern here is those who probably earn a higher salary who feel that a 1.5 deduction, percent deduction, will probably create some, some space in their budget. But Trevor, for the public interest, this Housing Act number seven of 2024 is a framework that will see this country move to a mid-level mid economy. And I always say this, that a good leader is one who gives hope one who goes against the grain, one who goes where other leaders fear to, f fear to go, one who implements. And that is the difference between His Excellency President William Ruto and other leaders. That he has dared affordable housing. And this framework is now in place. That it will actually improve the lives of Kenyans and touch each life. On the question that uh, I saw uh, in, the, in the board on regulations, regulations, uh, essentially uh, what we call delegated legislation. They will come in, but they must conform to the Act. The body of the Act, the Housing Affordable Housing Act, set out clear guidelines on how regulation shall be framed. A contributor to the scheme will be eligible for a house. And if they don't get one? And for the first time, and different from the, the, the slum upgrade project, you'll not be able to sell that house. You'll own it, and your children will own it. That is how uh, the US and England grew in terms of housing to ensure that people own property or own houses in cities. And that is how you stop, you backtrack on the slum question, because slums, people selling their houses moving to slums, and the next slums, as Manzu says, will not happen. And, and, and I'm sure everywhere else, people move to the urban 
the rural urban migration is on the increase. And how do you ensure that people live comfortable lives? It is by ensuring that they have houses and they contribute to. And this will streamline even the tax regime in this yeah. country. But what of those who don't get the house? Now, those who don't get the house, uh, of course, most people at the higher level echelons have houses, own houses. There's a social welfare question that we cannot sit back and say, when earning taxpayers' money from taxes that everyone contributes, we do not want to, contrib to contribute back to the same basket to improve the lives of our people. Okay. Let's look at it from that point of view. And the option will be there. That yeah. You have a job, you can contribute. Manzo here can contribute. I know you already has a house in, 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 in uh, Karen. He's got a house in Karen. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I don't know why he's complaining. So, let us not have leaders lie to us. Yeah. And I see leaders who even say we are fighting government. But when month end comes, they're scooping a million shillings in salary. I mean, let's be fair. Okay. Kenyan. Okay. Uh, well, I, I want to say that uh, I am ready and more than willing to contribute. But when I make my contribution, it must go to help somebody somewhere who is in the need. Okay. And I'm worried. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, you know the whole story of affordable housing as, uh, as is so muddled up. First of all, uh, there, there are private developers who are still doing it, where the land still belongs to them. There are, there are counties uh, who have land and are willing to partner to build houses. But the question is, what do we do? And that is where the lie is. And also the devil is in the details. The so-called regulations, that's where the devil is. Uh, and these regulations are made now by the minister in charge of housing. Uh, and now no one knows about what they will state. But uh, uh, what I want to, to, what I thought the government will address, and this is what in our manifesto in Azmir wanted to address, how are you going to house somebody who is a border border rider, who is a mama boga, who sells wuji in the construction places? You, you know, a person who is a mason in that, in that house they are constructing. How are those people ever going to own a house? That question has not been resolved. The truth of the matter is to construct just one single unit will cost about six million shillings. Uh, the lie which is being penned on is that uh, that house we have used, the, all the monies we have raised together and spent six million shillings building one house is going to be sold about 400,000. And uh, how is this Mama Boga going to ever raise 400,000? Nobody has answered that. Yeah. And that's why there's a big lie in this. It's just for political. And the only hope Kenyans have is to remove a government of these lies and bring in a truthful <laughs> government which can implement the housing project properly. All right, let's move on to a different